Alrighty. I'm going to begin with the introductions. If you're still grabbing water, you're not missing too, too much, so don't worry. Alrighty. Welcome everyone. My name is Hannah Manweller. I am the programs coordinator at Politics and Prose. I organize the classes, so if you ever want to join one, please do. Tonight we have a lovely panel. Um, first off, let me just introduce the different people and then I'll get into the rest of the logistics of tonight afterwards. First off, we have Melissa Stuttered, who is the author of five books. Her work has been featured by NPR, PBS, The New York Times, The Guardian, and many other places. Next up is Jane Wong, who is the author of How to Not Be Afraid of Everything from Alice James Books and Overpour from Action Books. And she also has a memoir as well that is going to be coming out in 2023, so do look for that. And then last but not least is Josh Charles, who is the author of the poetry collection, A Year, um, Collections, A Year, and other poems, which was fun, done by Milkweed, and then Feld, which was, I believe, also done by Milkweed, um, and it was a Pulitzer finalist and the winner of the 20, uh, 2017 National Poetry Series. So for today, we're going to do a bit of a Q&A, which I know sometimes doesn't always happen with poetry panels, but we're going to do one today. So if you'd like to put down at the bottom of the screen, there's the Q&A button. And if you'd like to put in a question there, we'd love to have it. Um, at the end, I'll be able to ask one or two of those questions. And so I'd love to see whatever you wish to ask them. Um, as always, when you're putting something in there, remember that poetry especially is a work that is done in a really beautiful way, but it also requires kindness with the questions. So please do remember to do that. Next thing is if you would like to buy the book, it'll be popping up in the chat. There's multiple books for today. So if you would like to buy any of them, you can just click on the links as they appear and you'll be able to go to the politics and prose page and be able to um, buy one there. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your support as always. And now I'm going to turn it over to them. Okay, awesome. I believe I'm going first. Yeah, awesome, cool. Thanks, Melissa, for the nod and thumbs up. Um, I'm gonna be reading from A Year and Other Poems today. Um, the sort of tentpole poem of the collection is called A Year. Um, I think it's kind of long and winding and I figured since there's three of us, um, I won't read those. I'll just read some of the other poems. Um, and also just given the, the politics and prose of it all. Um, yeah, they, they fit a little better, I think too. The first one's called A Note on Language. And uh, what to say about it? Uh, it's a new collection, so I still don't know what I'm talking about when I read from them, so forgive me. Um, I suppose I was thinking of a couple of things. Uh, maybe this is a very neurodivergent kid, trans girl thing, I don't know. But uh, I was thinking, one, uh, that constant feeling I've had my whole life of like a mother is walking ahead and holding your hand and dragging you, and you're just trying to like, hold up, wait, mom, wait, like I'm looking at something, you know, and that kind of feeling. And I wanted to write a poem that fit that feeling of like, wait, just just wait, wait a minute, you know? Um, and then that also led me to think about words and language some and why poems, why write poems? What is it that poems can carry or that they do carry for me that day-to-day um, -day speech doesn't or, or covers up or does in some inauthentic way or something? Um, and it led me to music, I guess. A note on language. Never having lived among, but beside form, I no longer look where the city lifts a little further past houses, ocean, light from a crane, no longer looking, the child hurried beside a mother moving too, too fast, at what escapes the grasp of leaves and awnings of leaves, past what is lifted, whatever word from whatever throat it's lodged, there being only one throat between us, past perception, and nevertheless perceiving as we must what moves between us, 
no longer a roof, but atmosphere, precursor and remnant of speech, remaining as it must, perhaps the least effective of our music. The sort of tentpole poem a year I wrote in, in 2016, uh, it was a very alienating year for me. Um, I won't get into it too much since I'm not reading any of those poems, but I wrote the other poems then in 2020 because it felt suddenly like, um, like in 2020, we all kind of caught up <laughs> with my 2016, which was very isolated and very, um, yeah, like uh, 2020 was. Um, so a large part of these poems is looking back and thinking about four years having gone by and still feeling like I'm sort of stuck in a year. I was also thinking about George Oppen with that one. Yeah, never having lived a month. A New York poem. I always thought New York poetics or New York poetry, what a ridiculous phrase. Seemed funny to name a poem. In. A New York poem. A brain is like the heart, but stupid. We text in a subway corridor, no service. Salt, hair, pollinate, ash, exiting, exhausted, sneezing blood through a park. A man quotes the raven beside, and we do not dare mention equivalence, summer, grass from lawns, torn dollars in the hands of children, clinging to roots only to pass time exhausted as the world heaves. A crow at our feet, in daylight as we know not discover anything but discover between us gliding flockless a raven a raven and a crow and a raven This one's called a fantasy. You know, I always think my poems kind of run ahead of me. They always tell me the next thought I'm going to have. And all I'm thinking about now is, is yeah, I guess neurodivergence. And, and now this poem suddenly seems like it's all about it. I didn't even realize. A fantasy, undiagnosable, see, und come on. Undiagnosable, the concurrence of a squirrel as I grope the branch it climbs and carrying an umbrella as I was and spilling my eyes, not interruption, but the logic of concert and lost the line given as I am to misfiring, running through shrubs, mushrooms and roots, almost screaming. It seems so little to matter this morning in a room within a room in a country given to misfiring and losing as it does not only words and climbing the largest oak at school. I remember backpack on my back full of rocks and smelling as I did, unlike I should, and not speaking as I do, and no one would kick so high. I thought of Zacchaeus when they took me down, groping at spilling rock and almost awake out a dream today. I turn to you to say, I think I will go running. We'll read two more. A song. Putting my finger through the hole the finch climbed through, a man, the very hose in his hand, a fruit carton props the door. There is no question of before, only pathless when you walk before or I walk before, meadow-like, god shadow, what we show of it. And then back to thinking about what a poem is capable of or what a poem can do, um, thinking about poems as perhaps not the best music there is. Um, something about desire. 
yeah, there's something. Yeah, the way that a media medium, yeah, there you go, can approach its own negation or something. Yeah. And poetry approaches music and desire approaches, I don't know what, the sayable. A note on form. Do not die, they say, at least today, full of sense. The pocket of city planted shrubs lining the street, not built, they say, but given. Concrete, the paint bucket of a man spilling dashed lines to road. It is sense he makes. And the brush fire from hills, these two are desert hills, spills to the road where we do not speak of poetry, a bridge built to burn itself, not unlike a mind. So open fire, already open the fire, boundless and stoking. I do not know what else there is at times, narrative, material split from raw material or preserving the split, only to talk on a mezzanine later of men, the wood we live, and under a star, a branch, the unsayable, possible in line to say, this was our desire. And I'll end there. I'm excited to hear my fellow readers. I'm thankful for Alan and Hannah and Melissa and Jane and everyone involved in getting this together. And thank you all for being here. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Now, Melissa, right? Okay. I, for some reason, I thought they would unmute me. So <laughs> sorry about the pause there. Uh, that was wonderful. Joss and uh, yes, I'm so grateful to everyone who's here and hosting and reading with me and uh, looking forward to hearing Jane too. Um, so I am uh, actually reading from a new book tonight. It's called Dear Selection Committee. So um, it is organized as if it's a job application. Uh, so the first part of it is the sort of like the uh, letter of application. And then after that, it is the um, uh, like the interview. And so it's, you can't necessarily tell when I read each poem that it's related to applying for a job, but uh, it's divided into subsections. So you can tell um, when you're reading it that basically it's organized so that the subheadings um, add additional meaning to the poems. So um, the first poem I want to read is uh, called, um, inside the beige brick house, the beige rooms. And um, it's a poem where the first line of the poem bleeds into the rest of it. And I wrote this poem, um, I was kind of thinking about how uh, as poets, we often don't really feel like we fit in anywhere. <laughs> uh, I know I didn't. It was only when I found other poets that I started to feel like, oh, my people, I'm not a total weirdo after all. <laughs> so this poem is kind of about that feeling and um, also about the work that we do as writers to unearth things. Um, so inside the beige brick house, the beige rooms and beige shirted people sit beautiful as unbuttered biscuits, their awful loveliness upon me. They want me drier than wheat and so still no marbles can roll from my head. I want summer flashing the yard red with begonias. I want ladder backed woodpeckers knocking at the gables and crepe myrtle blossoms blown down like hot pink cotton in a storm. I'm embarrassing like that. A walking faux pas no one wants to be seen with at the mall. I know compassion like the arms of a cactus. I know the scent of earth revealing her secrets after a much needed rain. I buried everything they told me to bury. Then I dug it up again. I think uh, largely that my work has been sort of so far this dance between feeling uh, imprisoned by um, my gender, by um, my past, 
by um, sort of the societal expectations. I grew up in the suburbs and um, there were a lot of expectations about how one should behave. Uh, so this next poem is about that and also um, a little bit considering my own complicity in caging myself within that. So, um, so yeah, it's like kind of the stance between setting myself free and <laughs> feeling imprisoned. So everyone in me is a bird. Mind was a prison, ruby lined in its lipstick nor everything woman I was expected to be trapped between papered walls. What they said to do, I did not, but only levitated at the burning. The body, a water in which I drowned. The life, a windshield, dirty with love. What they said to think, I thought not, but instead made my mind into a birdcage with wings. So the next poem is Migration Patterns. And I wrote this poem um, when, really when Trump started talking about the wall. And um, it's about immigration, but it's also about considerations of um, power. And um, I was thinking about, you know, how we empower ourselves. So migration patterns. In the dream, I tell customs, my llama is a goat. Because sometimes the heart is not large enough to hold what is beautiful if the mind finds it exotic. Sometimes the mind mistakes itself for a hoarded piece of land and little campfires spring up everywhere. Smoke slinks through chain link. Small hands and shoulders capsize beneath a dehydrated, salt sick sun. In the dream, I carry mountains through international waters. I carry the hills, their babies to safety. Sometimes I wave away a predator and there is fire in my hand and my hand does not want to be part of a human body. It wants to belong to the llama, the goat, the hills, the mountain. In the dream, I've got the North Star in my trunk. I'm taking it to a different part of the sky. It can't stand what it has seen. What we need is not a fixed point. What we need is a world anthem that everyone knows the words to. One that says, come in, come on, come over, I've got you. In the dream, light leaks from thin cracks where the trunk door meets the body of the car. The star says, put me on the dashboard and I will guide you. The officer says, illegal. You can't take a star to another part of the sky. And I say, watch me. I say, I've got enough light to do anything. I, you know, I think a lot of my poems actually come from dreams. I really did have that dream that I was trying to uh, smuggle a goat through customs. And, uh, you know, they were giving me a lot of trouble about it. And, Anyway, I think it's so interesting if we listen to our dreams, um, what can come from it. So the next poem is called Modus Operandi. And this is in the section of Dear Selection Committee where I'm talking about um, the, the personas, um, uh, you know, what she stands for and what she's all about. So uh, Modus Operandi. I put ranch dressing and the Greek salad. I stand in my front yard in the rain and yell, I'm the biggest waterfall in this desert. When people invite me to parties, I say no, then show up anyway. I bring my cat dressed in a graphic t-shirt with an image of another more attractive cat. I tell everyone I've just returned from my honeymoon and when they ask to see pictures, I show them the cover of the 1855 edition of Leaves of Grass. I like kissing people I don't know, sending flowers to random addresses and signing the card, eternally yours, God. 
I'm a window cracked in the rain. My name is sitting down and standing back up again for no reason. My motto is wings flapping. You should come back into my room if you miss me. I'll be there soon. I'm a thousand miles away on a different bed. So I think I'll read two more. Um, I'm going to read a poem called If Falling is a Leaf. I like to try to include at least one sexy or romantic <laughs> poem in a reading because um, it's a lot of what I write about. So If Falling is a Leaf, and this was actually inspired by a David Hockney painting. And I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but he has just incredibly vibrant colors, um, just beautiful. And um, okay, so If Falling is a Leaf. If falling is a leaf urging the earth into autumn, the branch is a lover who remembers orange unlocked at the gates of fire. Orange so bold it seduces green. Orange unbuttoning the sun and wearing it to summer's funeral. Because in loss, we are most vibrant. Because urgent regions of the leaf's mind ignite only when it opens to its own demise. All foliage is reincarnated into desire. And we're slayed by light coming in through a kitchen window as though we hadn't already seen it for decades through the same pain. So we sneak to the coat room of our own party to make love in everyone else's fur, feral but divine. Our behavior is not holy, holy, but the trees, oh my God, they wear their hearts on their leaves. And the last one I'm going to read is called, We Either Will or Will Not. And I, I think like a lot of people right now, I'm thinking about our children and how to keep them safe and the things that are going on in the world. So that's uh, definitely present in this poem. And uh, one strange thing about this poem is that I, um, I like to dance <laughs> when I write. And I was really listening to flamenco and dancing and writing this poem kind of at the same time. And uh, my publisher actually, when she uh, was making comments and edits said that she was like, I don't know what it is, but when I read this poem, I just feel like there's like flamenco <laughs> in the background. I was like, wow, you're good. <laughs> So, um, okay, we either will or will not die in this moment, will or will not throw plastic into the ocean, will or will not make love to the rumbling hood of the car and call it leaning, will or will not throw ourselves off the narrow edge of the universe, will or will not write the great American novel, will smoke pot or not, or not, or not, or will wreck the car, will not, will leave all our belongings to a river where we drank and peed back into itself. We will, we will staple ourselves back into the marrow. We'll dive deep into the hummingbird heart, learn to go faster. We will or will not. Will we, we will enter the Anthropocene, half opened, catch space junk falling from each other's mouths, stomp, stomp it out, stomp the laugh from the warbler, write letters to the presidents of distant galaxies. Stay awake in the wind that messed up the dandelion's hair. We will, we will stomp morning into the sun, stomp the sun's face into the basket. We carry to gather eggs, we'll paint the eggs, will or will not take them to the church down the street for the kids who would otherwise have nothing. We will or will not remember the kids, will or will not take the eggs, the eggs that are fertilized with the chicken's sorrow. And what will happen? To the, uh, to the children when they eat the chicken sorrow. We either will or will not notice, will or will not make change. We will, will we not, or will we remark on what it all meant? Thank you. Thanks so much, Melissa. And thanks so much, Joss, and Politics and Prose. I'm so excited to be here. 
Um, and also to really celebrate all our three new books. It feels kind of like really special to be here kind of celebrating like new things, um, especially as we move into the spring summertime. Um, I think I'm gonna actually read two newer poems and then I'll read a little bit from um, How to Not Be Afraid of Everything. Um, this one is called Strangers and it's for my father who's who's not in my life. And I had this moment like at the beginning of the pandemic where I was like, I have no idea how to check in on him. And I, I'm still wondering how he is, um, but it's called Strangers. An arranged marriage made me. Strangers standing to pose for a wedding photo made me. Hands folded like envelopes or touch-me-nots. Cigarette smoke and lily pond pucker. Across so much ocean, a stew of fish flashing back a heart or two. Okay, I'm making all this up. There was no photo. There's never been a photo. What I've been thinking about lately, I haven't seen my father in so, so many years. I worry I might not recognize him. <clears throat> That's not true. I could pick up his mahjong eyes, rustling regret from any lineup. I hope he is well. Hope he makes scrambled eggs in the morning, fluffy as a down comforter. That he is vaccinated, drinking less, even one tiny gemstone less. Hope he still stupidly wonders if I ever did wipe the snot from my nose in that one kid photo of me, or was he supposed to help with that? Maybe he is looking at his sleeves right now, considering their kid snot wiping capacity and wants to go back in time to do so. I have so many white hairs coming in underneath like a vast crinoline, and still I've been thinking about these things. Um, this next newish one is called I Cried in Public Again. <laughs> Felt moved to read this one today in particular. I cried in public again. I cried in public again. Drive, I said. Drive. I can't have people watch me cry. It's bad enough people watch me touch fruit at the grocery store. Prickly pear glaring across the sweet heaps. It's not my fault the citrus is too soft. It's not my fault you blame me, but maybe no one was watching me cry. Or maybe they were definitely watching me cry, making me a meme. I was an Asian girl eating a burger in the passenger seat, crying into the foil wrapper. Snot or cheese sauce or gelatinous exhaustion. Insert joke, accent, fetish. A sends me a message. Isn't it terrible to ask how are you these days? Like nothing fucked up happened today, so what? It's a good day? How bone true this is, how something will happen tomorrow and how something is happening right now, how to push the fear of this happening to those we love and we're supposed to eat? I message back, have you eaten yet? Please eat, I love you. I was trying to eat had soggy bun in hand, then the thing is, was, will be. Rage and grief and fear makes a terrible meal. What kind of nourishment leaves you this gray meat gut sick? I eat rage daily. It kiss claws its way through my arteries, my brain, my lungs, my pores, my mouth, my eyes leaking like a fish laid out to dry, flies coming in for a little sip. When asked what brings us relief these days, my graduate student of color says, sometimes I just scream as loud as I can. It feels good to let it out. I promise them I'll try it. Later, some white dude shares his meme of me in a group chat or Reddit thread somewhere. Me love burger long time lol, I'm screaming. Uh, so those are two newer ones. Um, and I'll just read a few poems from How to Not Be Afraid of Everything. Um, and I think I'll start with uh, this poem called The Cactus, which I've actually never read out loud. Um, but recently um, I did another reading and uh, a student had mentioned this was their favorite poem in the collection, which I actually was about to pull it out at the last minute. So I was like, oh, maybe there's something about this poem. I, I, I was like, not sure about it, but I thought I'd take a risk and read it uh, for the first time out loud. The Cactus. I've never planned on being weak. I thought of myself as a cactus flooded with sun and armor that could strike an arm or eye. I know how to hold my own arm to hold my breath when spirits pass as they do trailing after a desert rat, or at least I thought such things. 
I think of your fear of losing me. I think of a seal who can't make it back to water, its stupid whistling cry, the leaving, most of all, a shimmering plague. Who would dare to admit it? The buckling over, the cold bones of some other man's hands, the sleep for sleep's sake, for no reason but to wilk each spike, my armor plucked, how vulgar, a naked porcupine. Here at this gutting hour, I ask myself, what have you done? Do you even know? I know I am not a sight to see, even deer move around me, not looking. Plums from a tree fall and hit me straight on the head, the deer keep on not looking. That wobble, that wreck, I have tried again. I let down my hair, I lugged out my terror. The exhaustion, ad infinitum, throw everything you know into the ocean and watch it come back to you different. Oh, and I'm going to just keep reading um, poems I don't usually read. <laughs> um, uh, I think I'm going to read the one right that's right next to it, which is what I tell myself after waking up in fists. I tend to sleep with fists and I, I think when I wake up in the morning, I just do this like long stretch and it's like, uh, that moment of like finally being like, you know, there's a lot of fists in this book. What I tell myself after waking up with fists. Tired of fighting, undo your armor, stuck to your ribs like a good fat meal. Undo the gristle knuckled in the prior, in gluttonous bee drunk June, calling back what was never there. There, can you believe it, your mother says, a man can cry over a dead dog's dead body but won't look you in the eye. Facts multiply like the arms of an aloe plant, spears of fact. You have never done what has been done to you. Fact, each leaving radiates with alien light. Each apology, an overdressed salad you will eat. Nevertheless, vow, do not wash your face at night. Let all your hexes seep into your pores. Vow, uncurl yourself from weaponry. For you know what it feels like, an arrow in the arm, rustling in splinters. Allow, light what uses your strength against you, fawn, fear, or a wreck, each fist somersaulting into what knuckle, ruthless, write a poem for love before love can even exist. And I think I'll just read one more. Um, and this poem uh, was inspired by uh, me clamming for the first time. Um, and uh, when I clammed, I couldn't stop. I realized that like, I was just like taking all these clams. Um, and this was at a residency and they said like, well, take as many clams as you can eat, you know? And I was like, oh no, I will eat these. Um, and it brought me back to just even thinking about my family's um, history with, with hunger um, and, and thinking about that not being that long ago in terms of uh, my grandfather's generation, my mother's generation. And so sometimes I feel like, you know, when I was digging for those clams, I was almost kind of like unstoppable um, in terms of like feeding, I guess, my ghosts. Um, it's called I Haul a House Out of the Bay. There's something about digging my arms into mud as if I'm trying to find all the loves I've lost, dragging each burrowed foot, each ventricle in bivalves, how I tender the spit of the bay, murk trilling my arm hairs. The jutting claw of a crab eyes me from its windowless home. You and me both, I want to say. Mud, berries, and nail bends. My bending heart furnishes fat holes through weeds to sustain me. How my grandfather squatted as wide as a kite and dug to feed his children, the shells ringing along my mother's mouth otherwise songless. I pull clam after clam from the slumping earth and toss it into a bucket, clanging a warning for those who wronged us. The tide lulls in lopsided adoration. I haul these houses, my eyes dripping with clams. Salt air slops along my gums, punctuated with specks of sea grease, I bend to turn the earth again, the earth muscling against me, each hinge, each ghost opening. In the murky slew of day, I grit and dig, singing our long decay to sleep. Thank you all, and can't wait for our questions and answer session. That was beautiful. First off, you never read those poems other, at other readings? Sorry, that's the first question. 
No, you know, I've, it's so funny being, I think I've been on book tour since October and I kind of generally read similar ones, but um, sometimes, I don't know, I was moved today to read like new poems and ones I don't ever read out loud. Uh, so um, I don't know, I don't know, I was just moved. I felt, I felt, I just feel very moved and kind of cozy and safe in this space. So I was like, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> I love that. Um, well, I'm waiting for a couple other questions to hop into here. Um, something I wanted to ask Joss and maybe Melissa is if, do you have a poem that maybe you don't usually read, but something that maybe clings to your heart in a different way that maybe you want to read at the moment? Did something like jog your memory while Jane was reading at all? Um, I can try and think of something. Uh, <laughs> if nothing did. Yeah, let's see. Um, nothing came to mind, but uh, there, there's stuff I don't read, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> I guess that leads to a different question. Why, why do you choose the ones that you read? Yeah, I think I, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, uh, I think I choose the ones I think people will like, but also ones I have things to say about. Um, but I think the best poems are ones I don't have anything to say about. So I think I don't end up reading many of my favorites. Um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'll read one from Field, I think. Um, yeah, I think because Field is like kind of world buildy yeah, where like things accrue. I also tend to read the more like standalone ones, but some of them are really more intertextual or something or referencing of the project. And I never read those even though I like them. So here's a short one. This is poem 20 from Field. And if the earth is flat, how many folds in its deep? And if the fold is deep, how the reserve to its pocket? And if the pocket is a boy, and indeed the pocket is always a boy, who surfaces pit from plum, the poise of a tree, a word from its thing, if not you, my cyst, my precious crook, and if the horse knew the field from its bit, what is or isn't a book? That was great. Yay. <laughs> oh, thanks. I usually go for really hard rhymy endings and I uh I left that one on the edge of your seat. So that was a different thing. And I tend not to read it, maybe because of that. But I think it's an all right poem. I do too. I and I love what you said too about um selecting poems that you feel like you have something to say about and that some of the poems that uh you know you really love the best, you don't really have anything to say about. It's just the poem stands for itself. And I, I think you're right. I think. Uh, so many of us choose not to read those ones because, you know, we just feel like we want to chat a little bit in between the poems. But um, I did actually read a couple that I don't normally read. But in when you asked the question, it did make me think about a poem, which I'm trying to pull up right now, um, that is it's in this book. And the thing that made me think of it is that I believe that Jane and Joss and I all met for the first time at Paige and Coffee's wedding. So I was thinking about the poem that I read at their, um, I guess, rehearsal. They had a big poetry reading instead of a rehearsal dinner. And um, this is the poem that I read there. So, and I, I don't, I think at one time I read this aloud a little bit more, but I, I haven't been reading it for a long time. It's called Incantation. Speaking of vows, someone mailed the bride an envelope filled with finches wings, as if marriage could ever be so simple. The groom said, bring me this new dialect. I want to fill it with couplets. The bride said, first, show me the ladder in your throat. When they handed each other the promise, it looked like hoops of gold, but really it was a sunrise that will go on and on. After all, every poem is widest where it's been stretched by lovers walking in twos. But this must be how all marriages begin. Someone carrying an envelope 
filled with enchantment, someone opening it without breaking the wings. That was so oh, that. <laughs> I was going to say, it was like, that is exactly how we met. That's just such a, like, I think about that. We met due to love um, and poetry. <laughs> I know. I love that. And then we got to see a giant Jesus peeps. <laughs> oh, that's also true. That was later in the evening. Uh <laughs> <laughs> that was actually a question that came up in the chat was all of you are from different backgrounds and you're all from different places in your poetry like career and so what brought you all to this panel and i i might actually add to that because i know that politics pros arranged many of these things but what do you appreciate about each other's work hmm. i guess i can start um i feel like for me um you know Joss's work I've taught um field which I've always said felt when I'm like oh <laughs> like no I'm like that. um and my students are always just absolutely like stunned by the mixture of languages that occur in there um and it's just such an uh, emotional uh journey I think to to read it through the different languages which I believe is like middle is it right is that right middle English um yeah it's got some some middle Englishness to it, yeah. I like ishness to it. I like yeah. It feels like an ishness, um, and yeah, yeah. totally. And even just the space of the page, um, you know. I just uh, yeah. I'm always just kind of like trying to push myself. I think into to the places where I'm thinking about uh, different ways of speaking um, with your work. Um, and you know, I feel like for Melissa, even just like the poems you just read now, like. There's a, I think, a tone for me that really resonates with me. That's a kind of, um, I don't know, kind of confidence, like a surrealist confidence that I really adore. I'm always trying to find that that voice, like that that is so kind of like demanding to like I'm I'm here. I'm you know the marbles are not gonna fall off of my head or just you know I'm just even thinking about just all the images that kind of like keep popping up one after the other in your work too just like is I as someone who loves imagery I'm like oh yeah I can stay there for a while um but also the fact that we're both kind of evolving constantly as as poets and thinking a lot about kind of um what each new book kind of offers um us emotionally um, I was really moved, Joss, when you're talking also about the idea of like, you know, 2016 and 2020, like this, like how I feel like poets move through time in such a different way. I've been trying to think about that, like, you know, the ways in which there, there's a collapse of time for me. I don't know if that's been like for both of you, but in po poetry world, like I can create these like multiverses of time. Um, so, and that's part of just evolving as a poet um, and trying out new things, but I'll stop there. Cause I feel like I just like would keep talking. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, I think for me with um, both Jane and Joss, I admire their originality as poets. Um, I mean, I feel like you could hand me one of Joss's poems or one of Jane's poems <laughs> Uh, even a new poem that they'd just written and, you know, to, just say, here are a hundred poets right here who wrote this one and who wrote this one. I would know, oh, this is a Josh Charles poems. This is a Jane uh, Wong poem. So I love that and uh, the very distinct um, voices that they both have. So, um, I mean, I think that's what really stands out to me the most, but, uh, you know, like Jane, I love so many <laughs> things about both of their work. Yeah, I would say if gender is a spectrum, and I don't know if it is, one side of it is uh, uh, people who buy t-shirts for their cat and cry in public, <laughs> and we're all on that side. Yeah. Yeah. That's not sure if that's a great answer, but yeah. <laughs> 
That's a beautiful yeah. answer. I love that well, so you. much. And I feel actually really honored <laughs> that you said that. <laughs> I like sure, yeah. all in that. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. That, that yeah. niche of the polygonal space that is gender. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And it has to like yeah. be combined. You have to be wearing that shirt like while crying. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> while another yeah. cat looks at you in the eye. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, yeah, right. not again. Yeah. <laughs> You're not again. <laughs> yeah, never again. Um, no. this is a more specific question. And it's going to be a tad bit. I actually think that all of you slightly world build in your poems as you create scenes. So I don't think it's going to be as specific as perhaps um, this person asked for it to be. Um, but when you are creating poetry and that is world building, that is creating something that isn't actually technically there in a real world, do you, ex do you experience fatigue or exhaustion or loneliness when you're working on that project? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Makesha. Yeah. Um, I, Huh. I suppose there is a little bit of, for me, when I was writing field fatigue, but then, uh, then, then that meant the book was done. Yeah. So like, as soon as I got too tired to continue, then, I, then I stopped, you know? Uh, um, and in a way that was kind of nice. That was kind of a nice permission with like a year, I had a real hard time knowing when it was done even as like the conceit seems like it would imply that when the year's done, it's done. I kept editing the poems after that. And it was really hard to at some point just stop editing them and say no more. Um, so yeah, there's a kind of exhaustion maybe, but it's also a kind of permission then because once you reach the end, what, what more is there to do? You're done, you know? And, and I, yeah, it's kind of nice in a way to, to permit yourself to be done with something so clearly. Yeah. Jane, what about you? I really, I feel like that point about exhaustion is definitely also kind of like a moment where I kind of reach the end of a poem where I just, I'm like, I, I literally have fallen asleep <laughs> sometimes when I've been writing. Um, so I'm always just like, huh. Um, and just like exhausting yourself of, of trying to say something over and over again. Um, Cause that's ultimately what it is for me is like, I'm basically saying the same thing in almost every single thing I write um, just slightly differently each time. I think world building, I guess the one way I would kind of uh, think about it is that um, how to not be afraid of everything in part is about the Great Leap Forward. Um, which was like 1958 to 1962. And it's pretty much censored um, in China. And so there's a lot of propaganda around it. And there's a lot of, um, uh, let's just say it's really hard to research the Great Leap Forward from a Chinese perspective in particular. Um, a lot of the accounts are coming from Western perspectives. And so in a weird way, even though like what happened was real, and my family's history is real, I had to strangely world build some of it because I didn't have the research I needed in terms of like fact with a capital like F, that I had to kind of almost like do deep listening in a different way when I was, um, you know, talking to my family members um, because it, that's where it gets tricky is that like, I think oftentimes like writing about you know, especially something like intergenerational trauma um, can be hard because you don't know where to start. But for me, I was like, I had to give myself permission to actually, to some degree, like be okay with it being wrong or like inaccurate um, in terms of, you know, I don't know, like history, right? And I know it sounds complicated, but I couldn't interview my family members about the great before it like that's so damaging that's awful if I like just ask them about it it's so traumatic like you know my family starved um and they don't even use that word um and so in many ways I think there was a lot of world building in the when you died poems there's a very there's a very long poem in the book um kind of in the middle and to me it was kind of world building and it collapsed time like I couldn't separate past present future so that 
in many ways like <clears throat> like I could like reach into the earth into the ground to to hold my grandmother's like skeletal hands and we would just eat eggs together like I just it's it was kind of weirdly speculative even though I don't think I set out with the idea of world building but it kind of had to be due to censorship um due to the lack of research that there was on the Great Leap Forward um yeah yeah. Well, I feel like your so many of your individual poems build worlds, Jane. So yeah, I, I mean, it goes back to what you were saying earlier about surreal, you know, aspects to the work. I just sometimes I feel like I've when I'm reading one of your poems, I've got one foot in this world and one foot in a totally different world. Um, I think I want to answer this question by talking about uh, something that I'm working on right now, rather than the book that just came out. Um, I've been working on a book about Philomela's tongue. And if you're not familiar with that myth, um, Philomela was raped by her sister's husband. And then when she threatened to tell, he cut out her tongue. So I'm writing this very strange book in which uh, the tongue is actually the character. And um, it's kind of about what happened after the violence and the um, trauma that follows because there is so much emphasis and attention placed on an actual act of violence. Um, but then in this particular myth, the story ends shortly after that. And um, so the, the tongue is like this character who's out in the world having these experiences and dealing with PTSD. And um, it's a very strange thing. And uh, so, yeah, I, I had to really build a world there. And it was because of the intensity of the subject matter, it was really um, exhausting for me. And I, I participate in this thing called the grind where most months out of the year, um, we write a poem every day. And so I was writing these Philomela, I was on sabbatical, I was writing these Philomela tongue poems every day. And I found that I was getting in a really kind of dark and um, depressed state uh, because I was living in this uh, exhausting world where um, it was just constant PTSD. And I, I started trying to make some of the poems a little bizarre and funny, which <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's gonna work for that book at all. So then what happened is that I started writing these other poems, which became their selection committee um, in between the Philomela poems to give myself a break and to have a little light. So I'd write like three or four days of the week, maybe five of Philomela poems and then two or three days, um, one of these other poems. And um, yeah, so that, that was exhausting for me. And I think that the challenge in something like that is to figure out a way, um, you know, I feel like if I'm getting exhausted with it, then the reader will too, right? And I don't wanna do that to the reader. I wanna create something that, um, you know, even though it may be dark, it will have some, some lightness within it. Um, so I just had to really step away from the entire project for a little while while I figure out how to do that. So yeah, thanks. It was a great question, Acacia. Yeah. Um, so quick warning, we're almost at the end. So I'm going to give you the last question now. Don't answer it right away. Have a moment to think about it. And then I'll circle back to it in a second. Um, the last question is, either what are you reading right now or who is another poet that you think the audience should turn to and read their work as well. Um, but I will say that this is basically the end. So if you would like to go to the chat, be able to pull up that lovely list and be able to purchase one of these books by one of these lovely authors, that'd be great. And then also I'd like to thank our panelists because they're amazing. And thank you all for sharing your work. Thank you for sharing stories. Thank you for sharing so much of yourself with us in this last hour. Um, all right. Do you know other works or other authors that people might go to? Um, yeah, uh, I'm reading uh, uh, a Stephen Jonas reader, Arcana. It's really good. It's actually right here. It's incredible. Everyone should read it. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say that. Oh, I'll also say, uh, I just thought of this re, re world building. 
uh, there's a lot of worlds, right? Uh, worlds end all the time. Uh, we're in the United States who has ended more worlds in this place, you know? Um, it's just that there's a world that we think is natural, right? And it takes a lot of violence and power to make it seem natural. So I think we're all world building in our poems. That feels like maybe an important kind of caveat to say, just because if you think you're not, uh-oh, you know, what world are you in? That's scary. That's so true. Yeah, I mean, I think about po poeming in itself as a verb is exactly that. It is that that creating that that world. Um, and sometimes a world that is a bit um, more tender than the world we live in um, currently. I'm, I'm also going to do it Justin, which is like, just look around like my desk right now. And I have this book right here, which is Come Clean by Joshua Wynn. Um, and I believe this is his first book. And it's really fantastic. There's a bunch of poems here that um, I don't know, have like Marie Kondo in it, um, which just always like fascinates me. I want to show you like one of the forms too, like, like this is called Marie Kondo is my hero on organizing Christmas. So um, yeah, uh, Joshua Wynn, Come Clean. Okay, I uh, did the same thing. This is the book that's on my desk right now. It's by Emily Perez, What Flies Want. Um, and I picked it up in uh, Kent, the little town of Kent in a wonderful bookstore I found that had a lot of good poetry and, and contemporary poetry. So um, I just picked this up and started reading it. It's really wonderful. Um, it deals a lot also with gender and toxic masculinity. Um, and it, the poems are really um, just incredibly written. There's a lot of um, depth of um, sound and sound play and the way um, the language is hitting the ear. And I think like Jane, um, I'm drawn so often to poems that are uh, visual in my mind, metaphorical, imagistic. So to uh, move sort of towards this is a, a different thing from what I normally read, but I'm, I'm loving it. Yeah. I'm muted. There we are. All right. Thank you all for all those lovely suggestions. Um, that is the end of this panel. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you to the audience for joining. And I hope you have a lovely, lovely night. Thank you. Thanks everyone so much. Uh, it's a good sign. The sun is out. Um, you know, <laughs> Northwest, it's like, woo! <laughs> You're in it. <laughs> that never happens. Thanks everyone. Joss and uh, Jane. Thank you all. Awesome. Uh,